Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is a dear friend, Peter Sweetman, CEO and founder of Climate Strategy, an advisory firm based in Madrid. As well as being a social entrepreneur, he's an expert on climate finance and energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is such a vital part of the net zero transition, but it is so often shortchanged in discussions and when resources are allocated. Peter has probably done more than anyone else in the world to try to rectify that. Please welcome Peter Sweetman to Cleaning Up. So, Peter, welcome to Cleaning Up. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Michael. And uh, I'm assuming you are back in uh, Madrid after COP26, is that right? Yes, that's right. That was my first business trip uh, since the beginning of COVID, over two years. And and what sort of things did you go over to Glasgow to do? So uh, I've been attending the COPs mainly as a, I feel, an advocate for energy efficiency, really. Um, it's been one of the biggest sort of pieces of the puzzle um, for such a long time. And in Glasgow, it finally made it into the decision text. Is, is that really the first time that energy efficiency has been in the decision text? Surprising to say it is. Um, energy efficiency in the Copenhagen uh, COP15, it was the first one I went to, was really only mentioned by uh, Dr. Stephen Chu, the then Secretary of State for Energy, who said it was low-hanging fruit, um, and in fact, fruit already on the ground, ready to be picked up. And at the same time, the IEA uh, had said that it was around half of the emissions that were necessary to comply with uh, um, to comply with a, a two-degree scenario. Fast forward to Paris, COP21, energy efficiency is still not in the Paris Agreement, um, and yet IEA saying um, that it was around half uh, the emissions reductions necessary to deliver uh, a well below two degrees uh, outcome. Uh, six years later in, um, in Glasgow, um, finally, we, uh, energy efficiency continues to be 40% uh, or thereabouts of the solution, behavioral change uh, thrown in. Um, and, uh, uh, and finally, indeed, uh, in I think it's Article, uh, that, uh, article 20, 20, um, it says that uh, uh, energy efficiency should be upscaled, energy efficiency measures should be upscaled. Um, yeah, so right there. Well, that's just incredible because there's been all this focus in the coverage about the fact that coal was mentioned for the first time. And of course, there was this controversy about the wording that coal should be phased down, but not phased out. Was it phased down, I believe? Yes. Yeah. Um, and, it's the and same yet, paragraph, by the way. Right. But but nobody highlighted the fact that if, it, you know, if indeed it's the first time that energy efficiency made it into the text, in some ways, that is more important. It's certainly more important than the difference between phased down and phased out, which, as far as I'm concerned, are two ways of describing bluntly the same thing. Um, but the, uh, the, the fact that energy efficiency is now in the text for the first time, I mean, it's fantastic, but it's also, is it not just symptomatic of the kind of lack of seriousness, the lack of attention, the lack of senior attention that has been on energy efficiency throughout. And as you point out, it's half the solution, 40% or 60%, whatever the numbers can be at any given point in time. Absolutely. Um, so I've, I've been uh, sort of pursuing the energy efficiency for a very long time. Um, back in uh, 2013, um, when I was asked what what could the major contribution be to uh, climate change efforts at that time, climate action? I thought that um, taking energy efficiency and working with G20 nations, because that's where 80% of um, energy resources are used, uh, would be a great way to sort of collaborati collaboratively basically uh, get that down. So um, I, I managed to uh, become appointed the technical lead for the G20's Energy Efficiency Finance Task Group that was led by France and Mexico. Um, and uh, it, we, had a, we had a mandate from the 2014 G20 in Australia, um, and we worked with um, 15 countries. Um, and we, we went to the uh, Paris COP, as I said. Um, we took with us 
122 financial institutions, over 100 banks and $4 trillion worth of asset managers who are all pledging um, to increase their focus on energy efficiency and upgrade their um, activities around that. Um, we also had the voluntary energy efficiency principles for, uh, for G20 participating countries that actually was attached to the G20 leaders meeting in Antalya. Uh, and then uh, in COP as well, um, we focused on that in the very first ever Buildings Day um, that uh, was arranged at the COP and then repeated in Glasgow, where we, have I think for the first time, started to recognize the importance of buildings and how much of our emissions take place in cities and in the built environment within that. Well, this is this is great because what it's going to do, I think, as we talk over the next um, sort of half hour, 40 minutes, is we're going to touch on a lot of topics that have been raised by different um, uh, participants, different guests on cleaning up. So built environment, actually very early on, I had um, Anthony Slumbers, um, who was episode three. Um, and then, of course, other champions on this, Rachel Kite, episode two. Uh, we had Jonathan Maxwell, episode 14, talking about financing energy efficiency. And in fact, um, uh, because we're recording this before it's gone out, you won't know this at the moment, but a week before this airs will be, of course, the, I don't know what, whether, I, I don't know if it's, I don't want to be ageist about it, but the grandfather or the father of energy efficiency, Amory Lovins, um, who for 46 years has been pushing energy efficiency as the bedrock of uh, climate and environmental action, not the add-on at the end. Now, that's what we're going to be doing during this next uh, sort of this, this during the show. But I feel like we've dived into the middle because <laughs> the viewers, for all the fact that you are legendary in our space, many of our viewers and listeners won't know your personal story. So take us back to um, you studied at Cambridge on a very interesting course. It was engineering and management. Um, and it was, it, it was an unusual course because at the time, everybody else was doing three-year engineering courses like me, and, and yours was a four-year course. Um, and then you, you left there. That was when you, but you left there and went straight into finance. Is that right? Does that encapsulate correctly? No, I mean, that's, that's right. I mean, I, in fact, it's even sort of better than that. So at the time, this was pre the judge school, that the, which is what became the business school of Cambridge. And engineers and natural scientists were offered after the first two years to specialize. Instead of specializing in, say, thermodynamics, you could take, or I took, what was called then management studies tripos, which was the uh, trial course uh, for the eventual business course. So we had a one-year course that gave us what I felt was the tools um, for, doing, for doing business. And that's kind of what moved my direction away from the more traditional engineering space and into um, sort of the, the finance space, really, because it, it sort of gave us different direction and then made us more attractive to different types of employers. So I was in too much of a hurry to, do, to turn my three-year course into a four-year course. I wanted to go skiing. <laughs> and so I, although I was very attracted, and of course, naturally, I should have started the shift into, you know, uh, business and finance and so on while I was still at Cambridge. But I just thought that I saw um, thermodynamics was the shortcut to get out as quickly as possible onto the slopes. Um, so you joined, um, you, you, put, you joined then JP Morgan, uh, yeah. I'm going to get this right. Yeah, JP Morgan Corporate uh, Finance. Mm. And you did nine years there. Mm. Were you doing energy were you doing efficiency were you were you woke at that point because of course you're super woke now but was, did that journey start before or during the time at jp morgan or was it after well i, I think i'm certainly awake um there was <laughs> long long hours at jp morgan i certainly remember that um i i spent a lot of the time there in the capital markets group um the capital markets group is essentially uh, worked with borrowers, so that's governments and companies and banks, um, to uh, to launch debt, uh, to, to borrow money from the capital markets. So in a way, um, I got a, a very sort of front row seat to understand, I mean, everything from uh, sort of currency crisis. I, I worked uh, with uh, European uh, companies and governments. I also worked with Latin American companies and governments and, and saw sort of firsthand the volatility of the capital markets, what it takes to be able to borrow money as a, as a corporate or a government entity, and some of the more technical dynamics of that, which frankly have served me pretty well subsequently because um, there have been you know, markets crises that have affected all levels of, of work. And whilst it's not directly related to energy, 
um, a number of the companies that I work with, were, of course, were energy companies. So uh, back in 1995, I issued the very first uh, US dollar denominated uh, bond for the company, Spanish company Repsol. That was their first ever international transaction. So then sort of wind the clock forward as a, as a client of my current current business, we, you know, have been working to try and help them decarbonize. So uh, there's some consistency there, but it's not direct. Interesting. And Repsol, of course, of the oil and gas companies, the one that has most definitively um, uh, approached net zero in 2050, I believe. And energy efficient too, yeah, in terms yeah. of the way that they've approached it. Yeah. So, so then you, you left JP Morgan during the dot-com boom bust cycle but you didn't do what I do, which was chase the, 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 the quick win, try and build some of these uh, companies. And then ultimately, I became a venture capitalist on that stuff. But you took a different route and you built a social enterprise. Yes, you're right. Uh, it, it wasn't what I had intended, actually. Um, I, took a, I took a year out of, of, of JP Morgan because I, I was keen to see how I could sort of make, make a difference in some way or do something different. Um, I had a number of ideas at the top of my mind. Um, I've, I invested in a couple of businesses that friends were starting at the time. Um, but the idea that wouldn't go away was the one I ended up sort of delivering, which was uh, called at the time Charity Technology Trust. It's now called Charity Digital. Um, but the idea was a pretty simple one. Um, a lot of change was happening in the commercial space, but um, UK charities, and at that time I was pretty close to uh, Bernardo's, uh, the uh, National Trust and others, um, uh, they seem to have been stuck in the 1970s in terms of what their technology setup looked like. So what Charity Technology Trust essentially did was um, sort of try and provide or be a friendly, because it was a charity itself, try and be a friendly outsourcing agent for all the technology woes of uh, NGOs. And so we began processing um, their raffle tickets, actually. And then we moved to processing uh, just general donations and payments, sort of like the, the Donate Now button on their on their websites. We provided them email distribution lists and email uh, sort of management payment services of all kinds and used the, the, the leverage of having multiple charity clients to get better deals. So better deals through the card processing fees, better deals through the shared technology services, reducing their costs. And in fact, now it's, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of Charity uh, Digital because today they have saved over a quarter of a billion pounds worth of technology costs and investments for 38,000 uh, UK charities and NGOs. They've processed 300 million pounds worth of charity payments. Uh, they sent 6 million UK charity emails a month, and they've educated 400,000 professionals in the charity space around technology. Incredible. And you call yourself the poorest guy who ever gave a quarter of a billion pounds to charities. <laughs> yeah, on a good day. It is amazing how that period was a period of such dramatic change. You know, we are, I think, going through a similar thing now around climate technologies. But um, just uh, a couple of days ago, a company that I was on the board of, uh, Interactive Investor, sold to Aberdeen uh, Asset Management for one and a half billion pounds. And it was just something I did at the time. And it wasn't a, it was, you know, it's not something that I would sort of want necessarily written on my tombstone, but I was intimately involved and it has become very, very big. So uh, um, I think one, one thing that we should do maybe over the holidays is think about what's what, what are the opportunities today that are going to be in uh, 20 years time, you know, having that sort of impact, quarter of a billion uh, pounds saved, uh, a billion and a half uh, market cap, you know, and indeed, of course, much more, because there certainly are startups and businesses out there that are going to be on that track. And then I'm afraid there's also going to be an awful lot that are not, because a lot of what was going on back then didn't turn into something huge, did it? Yeah. I mean, I, I always kick myself for the, I mean, the amount of time, so 20 years spent in climate, the, the amount of great ideas that emerged so early on. So in the Copenhagen, just in the preparations of the Copenhagen COP, um, a Tesla was brought to the conference center where we were and everybody was offered the opportunity that was the roadster, the opportunity to drive it. And it was, you know, it was a fantastic car. It was a fantastic experience. And that was when 2009, you know, so uh, that was one thing. And then I remember thinking about how we decarbonize uh, sort of uh, food and, and all these new choices on offer. And uh, I just remember thinking at the time, wow, 
we've you know the 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 market for for lab food and non meat meat yeah. is going to be huge you know on this basis but of course i never i never found that an investment so i didn't look very hard but i did just you know you kick yourself for not at the very time you first had the thought putting some money aside to invest in those companies i i must try and get uh, ira aaron price my friend ira who invested in tesla i had nancy fund on but ira when he invested in tesla uh, i said he was mad you know this is a california venture capitalist investing in a car company uh, and and clearly it was a stupid idea and then when it ipo'd and i saw him again i said ira you've done brilliantly i was wrong sell everything get rid of these tesla shares as soon as you can it's a car company you know nothing about california venture capital whatever and he said no no you don't understand and of course i was magnificently wrong once again but there you go um So but I just want to you know I don't want to take too long on the early history because we've got so much right. to cover. Um you and I met when you were at Climate Change Capital and Climate Change Capital course had been um started by um so uh, James Cameron I'm looking down because I'm trying to find the episode numbers but uh, James was uh, was on this show talking actually about international trade but he had started he and two other co-founders had started this um bank uh to to bank all of the money that needed to flow into climate solutions and that was where you ended up right that's right so um i i remember so my meeting with james was what got me into climate because uh i attended uh, when i was working running charity technology trust i was invited to attend an environmental dinner one a couple of my clients were WWF and Woodland Trust at the time but James spoke and he talked about climate change and I went up to him after the dinner and I said James it was a you know wonderful speaker and it's really incredible what you've said you've really opened my eyes to this um of course you know it's so dramatic what you what you've presented I I just can't sort of take it all in give me a reading list so I so I went away and did a reading list and then I came back to him and I said well this problem's too big for just the organizations who are involved currently to solve this needs to be solved by global fin- global financial markets or at least global capital markets need to be aware of this more so so um he said well we're setting up this uh, climate change sort of investment bank or climate change bank um called climate change capital why don't you come and join us so um it it coincided with my uh, having just got married and, and and my wife is spanish and so we were moving to madrid and so i said well let me come in let me review the business plan uh, which i did and 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 then i made a a personal investment in the in the company um because at that time they were rearranging the the founders so I got to buy some founder shares um and uh wrote the sort of the business so I helped them rewrite the business plan and and then re- write the the business plan for Spain so effectively what I what I did um based in Madrid was open the climate change capital branch in Madrid um looking after sort of Spain and Latin America which was great because at that time um the Spanish utilities were among some of the um sort of uh, the the ones that needed to transition the most so they had uh, large sh- sort of shorts in the uh, uh the first round of the um uh e- eu ets markets and in latin america there was the opportunity through the clean development mechanism to invest in emissions reductions in those uh, geographies and bring them back into the european uh, market so it it sa- sort of it sort of worked particularly well and and of course during that time uh, we we had a spain had a, a solar a solar boom and um you'll remember that michael because we wrote about it i was uh, involved with Banco Santander at that time and BP Solar um setting up a, a, a solar fund and that sort of sort of years later became the seed for Cubico investment uh, management um and and I was on the Kyoto compliance sort of uh, private sector su- support group of the then secretary of state Teresa Rivera for the carbon markets advisory and we did sort of offshore wind uh, uh, in, in uh, sort of uh, advice and and other things so it was really a, a very productive time and uh, of course Teresa Rivera uh, was another guest on cleaning up so uh, mm. this little sort of M- michael's mafia uh, is, uh, is 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 it's quite uh, interconnected it's not just that they that uh, you all know me but you all know each other and just for the listeners the episode uh, with james cameron uh, was episode 23 um and and that was a marvelous episode although as i say mainly focusing on trade so around that time you and i met because i was starting new energy finance um climate change capital was this blazing um star in the firmament i just wanted to be a very small meteor providing my little uh, information services and you and i met 
um, climate change capital was not a vast success. Uh, and I think that was re related to um, the various crashes in the car EU carbon markets, which uh, I think probably scared off a number of investors. Um, uh, so unless I'm, I'm wrong, you then moved on. And from there, you started on your, you started your own business, which is climate strategies, but with a very strong focus on energy efficiency. So maybe it's yeah. what, what happened to the carbon markets and why energy efficiency and what, you know, what first attracted you to the multi-trillion dollar opportunity of energy efficiency? Sure. Um, so actually, um, you, your sort of, your categorization is exactly right from the inside. What we were trying to uh, launch actually was a green infrastructure fund around 2007, 2008. This was the big new sort of product, which of course today, uh, there are many of them, but at that time, that would have been the first green infrastructure fund. And in the context of that green infrastructure fund, I was working on a on a what we called a side pocket of a, an allocation to energy efficiency, because we felt that energy efficiency was very much an underserved space. And it seemed like um, as, as Stephen Chu had said in, in Copenhagen, that there was a lot of very profitable um, and very attractive opportunities, literally everywhere, industry, buildings, cities where you looked. Um, and so we thought that the best thing would be is to have a, a, a sort of a specific strategy within the Green Infrastructure Fund on energy efficiency. And so it was really through that work. And of course, you're right, um, the financial crisis caused the carbon price to to fall dramatically and that's uh, the thing uh, and that's the thing which also caused that green in infrastructure fund not to be able to be raised because at that time you just couldn't raise funds in that environment so sort of at that time um it, it's true i set up climate strategy and of course when i did set up climate strategy um, I wrote an email to Professor Michael Grubb, who runs the, or at that time was the chair of the UK-based NGO called Climate Strategies, uh, which um, is better known than my small firm, but uh, often uh, often confused, uh, and I, it, in the nicest possible way. And, and Michael is one of my absolute heroes, and I continue to read his uh, his missives on innovation and other things. But um, yes, we've. We've really been uh, working with Spanish companies, uh, mainly Spanish companies, on uh, uh, implementing climate sort of action or climate change strategies and uh, illustrations of that, because I'm often asked, what does that actually mean? Uh, so we helped uh, Inditex, which is a fashion retailer, map its supply chain all around the world and write a global energy and biodiversity strategy. Um, we did the first carbon footprint of a private pension fund. Um, we engaged with the supply chain of the Spanish grid company, Red Electrica, and, and uh, over a number of years to help them decarbonize down the supply chain. And this is really early days stuff. And we, we were, I, I helped uh, bank... BBVA, the, now the second most sustainable bank in the world, write its first uh, climate change strategy over a decade ago. And one of the one of the sort of long term projects which I'm most proud of is we've been working for over a decade with the Ferrovial Group, which is one of the lo world's largest infrastructure groups. Um, and uh, it, back in 2010, just after launching Climate Strategy, we helped them write their first uh, uh, sort of group wide climate change strategy. Um, we then set uh, and implemented initial CO2 targets for them targeting the year 2020 back in 2011. We implemented a shadow carbon price for them in 2014. We did some uh, assessment of the climate risks and opportunities in 2018. They set a science-based target and a carbon budget for themselves for 2030. They beat their carbon targets that they had set for themselves in 20, back in 2011 for 2020 and 2019. And then uh, they were the first global uh, infrastructure manager to achieve its its targets, and now has a commitment to reduce by another one third, essentially, uh, their emissions by um, 2030. So again, there's sort of it's been a it's been a while, but uh, there are some uh, companies in Spain actually that are doing a, doing a great job. Right, and uh, and and uh, Ferrovial, I'm sure, will be very happy with the plug that you've given, the extended plug, uh, which is great. But it's a very important point you're making, which is, you know, this is profound stuff. This is not greenwashing, and there are the case studies and the examples of greenwashing, and there are the case studies and examples of really profound action. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that's so fascinating talking to you because you've you've sort of been around and helped catalyze, you know, some of the real stuff. Um, along that route, and by the way, I do apologize for getting the name of your company wrong, Climate Strategy, not Climate Strategies. And for the listeners, and we'll include links in the show notes, that is Climate, 
www.climatestrategy.com and you can follow Peter on Twitter at climate st all one word climate st um, and along that path you wrote what I consider to be an incredibly uh, important document uh, and this is we're talking about in 2017 with the OECD this was I mean it, you know the, the sort of shorthand I could just call it the you know, the, the Bible on financing energy efficiency, but technically it's called the G20 Energy Efficiency Investment Toolkit 2017. Um, and you know, to, how did that come about and what happened to it? Because there is a subtext going on here, which is all of this magnificent work with some magnificent case examples on what is one of the most important pieces of 40, 50, 60% of the solution you know, uh, piece of, of climate action. And yet we are underperforming on energy efficiency. We are nowhere near the 3% per year that the IEA says we need to deliver. Um, actually, I think three, I think it's even 4% for one and a half degrees and 3% a year for, for two degrees of, of, of warming. So we're failing but you're doing this magnificent work. So that book, maybe you can kind of li link all of those kind of thoughts together. I'll try. And one of the things that I've realized being a, I suppose, a climate technocrat, so just advising on policy matters, is the policy cycle is really long. Um, and so that story itself actually, so that the 2017 uh, sort of book was really a compendium. And the story begins in 2013, actually, with the European Commission and the United Nations Environment Programme Finance Initiative uh, getting together to launch something called the Energy Efficiency Financial Institutions Group, which I continue to rapporteur to this day. So, so at that time, it was a, it was an idea. We uh, we we uh, the Commission gave us a sort of a mandate letter. They they actually wrote down three questions they wanted on, answered, which is. Um, sort of why is energy efficiency uh, investment uh, at the level it is? How can we increase it? And what can the commission particularly do with respect to its regulatory uh, authority? So uh, we, I said about with 120 other people, uh, 100 organizations, 40% of them financial institutions to write a report which was launched by Mara Shevkovic, the then vice president of the commission, um, alongside the European Union strategy. So the sort of the piece that I guess perhaps hasn't got as much as attention, but it's all there. And that was considered to be a landmark report by the energy efficiency community because it, it looked at uh, not just the supply side of, of finance. Um, in other words, is there money and, and the banks have enough and do investors have enough and are they keen enough about energy efficiency and do they have the right instruments to, to do it, which they do. Um, but is there a sufficient demand for energy efficiency in buildings, industry and SMEs? And so we provided sort of a set of recommendations at the time, which I actually, we just launched the 2.0 version of that report at COP26. So uh, people can go and read uh, sort of how we did essentially. But I, I think um, that connects to the G20 uh, book, because that started a structural assessment process between government uh, sort of policymakers and financial institutions that then rolled up into the G20, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, through the Energy Efficiency Action Plan of 2014 launched by the Australian government. Um, we took a lot of the um, tools, so finding best practices, identifying key policies. And what we discovered in energy efficiency is there's loads of policies out there. There's over a thousand policies that have been identified by the IEA's database on energy efficiency policies. So what the uh, so the the first thing we did is is f figure out how to order the policies. So how do we categorize these different types of policies? Because it's very hard um, to to uh, to know sort of where to turn if you're a government. So we produced something called the Voluntary Energy Efficiency Investment Principles for G20 participating countries, which is essentially a checklist of five sort of key areas that you need to sort of see that you've got policies that cover all of them. And, and then in the toolkit itself, we then do that analysis for all, the, for all of the countries to see where the gaps are. And of course, there are areas where there's lots of sort of targets, there's lots of targets, but there are lesser um, sort of pi investable pipelines, for example. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that one of the things we highlighted in the voluntary principles and then again in the, in the, in the, in the toolkit was acting on the lowest hanging fruit and the worst performing buildings and 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 and, and components of, of industries and processes which has been very very widely adopted i think since then and i and i'm particularly hopeful actually now that we have the fit for 55 um 
pack regulatory package in Europe that the um, buildings directive, uh, because buildings are so important in terms of our uh, in terms of the um, uh, trajectory to decarbonize to get to net zero, um, uh, will hopefully address the uh, low hanging fruit and the and the lowest performing buildings in Europe through through mandatory uh, energy performance standards, which is a policy which has really emerged sort of a long time since we since we wrote initially about it pointing a little bit to the sort of long policy cycle. So in, in a sense, um, some of the achievements, I mean, we, we changed things like accounting rules on energy performance contracts for local authorities, which again, it just sounds so deeply technical and, and sort of unexciting, but it unlocked an enormous, an enormous amount of uh, very simple basic funding for cities who wanted to change their lighting schemes and, get, and, get, and, and deliver savings, which had been prevented because in order to do so, you needed to raise more debt and they had debt ceilings. But the irony was that they were investing that to save money, but the ongoing costs weren't captured or the present value of the savings weren't being captured in the upfront decision. So they were being prevented from making those sensible investments anyway. So, you know, I could, I could go on for a long time, uh, but the, but the, uh, the results of uh, the toolkit uh, and the results of the Energy Efficiency Financial Institutions Group are still really being, being felt sort of today. And it's almost now that we're seeing the fruit of, the, of, the fruit of that come, come forward. You know, that, there's so much there that I identify with because uh, 2019, I was um, invited to be one of the commissioners on the IEA um, Commission for Urgent Energy Efficiency. And it was uh, a tremendously eminent group, uh, all of them, you know, either sort of senators or ministers plus me. Um, um, but And one of the things that I did was to ask, why are we reinventing the wheel? We're all sitting around um, thinking about how could we accelerate energy efficiency? And I sort of uh, brandished that 2017 uh, G20 book that, that you had written. And, you know, and there wasn't a huge awareness that it existed, um, I, I would say, um, because it is, you know, these areas are so dense and so technocratic. Of course, the people who work on energy efficiency all the time know about these initiatives but when you get your average you know new energy minister or your average u.s senator they don't know all the work that has been done so you've got this kind of tremendously long policy cycle but there's also entropy to use a thermodynamic term there's also you know work that was done in the 1980s that was great and i asked uh amory lovins the same question 46 years you've been banging on about the same things they're so obvious. There's money lying on the floor and people are not picking it up. What is going wrong? So um, I think what I learned through all these processes is that you need to have a high degree of constancy of, of sort of technical expert support. So um, there is certainly, um, you know, for any minister that wishes to become informed, they can ask the right questions and become informed. And one of the things of having constant task groups that keep working um, at the so I, I, I discovered working at the G20 what an amazing pyramid of support that happens to that single meeting that takes place annually. So beneath each uh, leaders meeting you have the ministerial meetings and beneath each ministerial meeting you have three preparatory meetings and essentially the technical work takes place within the preparatory meetings and the preparatory meetings where all the countries sit together with their delegations are informed by uh, usually international organizations or specific task groups that are asked to do work for to inform those meetings so um there the the work itself you you um you, you need to make sure that uh, you've been able to have side meetings with all of the key, with all the key uh, delegate lead delegators and so on to inform them of the key things that are in the work because most of the files that they have on the desks are big and and so you become quite adept at uh, essentially trying to identify what are the key benefits the, that will that will your work will deliver into the collaborative discussions and part of that is the using of national case studies and making sure that you've considered national circumstance and can, and recognizing what the uh, the specific economic and social and and governance sort of benefits will be in the country of the activities that you're proposing but also placing that into the wider sort of sort of political circumstances at the moment um, there's also as you quite rightly put i mean different sort of 
what I think what the energy efficiency community is only just doing, and, and I think I'm, I'm delighted to say that it is now becoming mainstream. And I think that when something becomes mainstream, it's just that it's not that these things haven't been written down before, but it's, I mean, the Financial Times did a special report on energy efficiency just a week ago, commenting on how, uh, so how energy efficiency didn't appear very much in the COP and talking about some of these themes. And that's, so when The Economist does a special energy efficiency, the, the Financial Times does, the Wall Street Journal starts to talk about it, and then it starts to percolate into the sort of collective consciousness is when really, I think, uh, genuine activity starts to happen. And I think that's right. You know, when you need, when you get um, prime ministers and cabinets thinking about energy efficiency, that's when we know that from the policy perspective, we've kind of arrived. Um, my one anecdote there is when I was on the uh, board of transport for London. Uh, and of course, the mayor was Boris. And uh, Boris was um, he came bouncing into one of the meetings. And he was very excited because of energy efficiency. Um, but I will say it probably wasn't because of energy efficiency per se. It was because he thought of a fantastic line to say that London was leading for lagging. And this was his energy efficiency joke. And it was and that was how we got it on, or how, how it got onto his agenda. But let me ask another question. OK, so on the policy front, right, you've got this long policy cycles. And I've seen it because I saw the process whereby sustainable energy for all and we talked about this in various of the cleaning up episodes with Candy Yumkeller, um, uh, with uh, Rachel Kite, uh, with Damilola Ogunbi, and so on. How you go from a cross, it was a UN in, uh, interagency initiative, and then eventually it became SDG 7. But that process took a good 10 years, which I was very involved in. So you've been very involved in the process of energy efficiency, sort of going to not quite yet cabinet and prime minister level, but, but getting pretty close. But isn't there possibly another problem, which is that all of that is not really connected. You know, if that's the, if, you know, if that's the, the engine, it's not really connected to the wheels. Because I'll give you three examples. Um, one is in the UK since 2005, all boilers that are installed have to be condensing boilers, much more efficient, right? 2005, so 16 years. So most boilers in the country are condensing boilers. The vast majority are set up at too high a flow temperature so they don't condense. You literally, if we had, you know, heating engineers go and visit each home in the UK, the UK could save the estimate is 6 to 8% of its gas requirement in domestic heating, and by the way, officers are not different, probably maybe a little bit better, we could save six to 8% just by having an engineer visit, turning down the flow temperature and adjusting the thermostats and the timers so that heating would be on longer at a lower temperature. Six to 8% savings doesn't happen, right? Um, another example, I have a, I'm very blessed and I have a, a, a ski chalet, as you know, in Switzerland. And it has this thing that says, uh, I can send a text message. I send, when I leave, I can send a message that says, chauffage off. And the, the machine comes back and it says, chauffage is off. And then when I go there, I can send another text message saying, chauffage on, and it goes on. And I was very confused why my heating bills were so darn high since we're only there, you know, so, so many weeks a year. And it took three years to discover that when the machine said chauffage off, it was just lying. It was fake news from the heating system. It was actually leaving the heating on and simply sending the text message. So there was, so you've got a policy problem of the boilers at the wrong flow temperature. You've got a technology problem, a, a technology disconnect. And the third example is not strictly climate, but you will have heard of these things called diesel particulate filters. And that's to stop air pollution, particulate pollution. Well, guess what? There is a huge industry in the UK of disconnecting diesel particulate filters because they make the engines less powerful. And a lot of people, particularly white van men and women, like their vans to be a bit more powerful and not to, uh, and, and so they get these things disconnected. They also saves diesel. It actually makes the engines more efficient not to be running them. So it's, so, um, so you've got a human behavior disconnect. So you've got policy disconnect, technology disconnect, human behavior disconnect. 
And you've got all these airy fairy policymakers that you're all working with that you finally, after 30 years, have trained to care about energy efficiency. But are they really connected to how you get this stuff done by heating engineers, by um, you know, mechanics in, in, you know, on vehicles and so on? A lot of questions there, Michael. I'll try my best. So just in reverse order, perhaps, um, the IEA's net zero pathways break out for the first time this in this edition, what we call behavioral change from uh, sort of the more techno consumer led energy efficiency. And by, by behavioral change, what I refer to is the vans realizing that actually you can have a faster, more efficient, lower cost of ownership electric van, uh, particularly if there's a currently a promotion to, to do that. And in the longer term, that will be more efficient because you don't have all of the losses that occur between the fuel, not just sort of the fuel getting to the pump, but even the fuel in your tank being converted into um, energy in the wheel. And you've you've discussed this before, but you know there's a 60% loss in the vehicle itself. And then there's a probably a supply chain loss of some other 50% um, from well to wheel. So it's really inefficient to have uh, a, a diesel vehicle compared to the electric alternative. So that, that I guess is, is sort of point one. Point two, about to your point on, there's the human element of energy efficiency. And, and we I sort of learned this, first of all, because uh, the very early stages when climate change capital had launched the very first green property fund back in 2009 that was a, a 160 million uh, pounds if i remember correctly and it was basically uh, buying uk buildings in the middle of british cities um and it was doing extensive retrofits and then sort of to, to the highest environmental standards and then leasing them or, or selling them sort of out and there was and i and i always remember talking to the team tim and esme at that time and they said well Often we go into a building and a good example was uh, there was a building in the middle of Birmingham, five St. Philip's Place. Um, it was a government lease building and it, it had quite a good energy rating. And yet the meters themselves didn't work. The boilers were on 24-7 and that was completely unnecessary. And they managed through sort of simple tech rather than sort of sort of smart tech, let's say, to take the energy spend down 61% and the CO2 emissions down by half from 28 to 2008 to 2010, just through what we call sort of simple simple methods. The, the other good example that I remember, again, things have moved on a lot since then, luckily, but we we did a couple of uh, sort of au sort of audits or work with uh, banks to think about reducing the energy use in, in their branches. And uh, I chair a company called Energy Efficiency Capital Advisors that has done a lot of work, um, not just with banks, but also with cities to reduce their energy footprints. And um, we, f we found that uh, in the first in the first in the old days when banks used to look at their energy use they had two um, sources of the use of e electricity one was for the offices uh, the air conditioner devices and the lights and one was for the ATM machine the cash point machine um, but uh, uh, they had moved branches so many different times in so many different locations that often they'd forgotten to switch off the contract for the power to the ATM. So when they first did an audit of all of the contracts they had, of all of the electricity they had, they discovered that whilst they weren't using power, just cancelling the old contracts where the old ATMs had been moved from was a massive cash saving at the time without even saving any energy per se. It was just being efficient about the way in which you contract for power. So to your, to your point, there is, I think, an enormous amount of inefficiency in the, in the way in which we have just left to one side um, the energy component of businesses, which which is now rapidly changing because businesses are now required to report um, on their non financial activities, and this is a this is I think is the is the biggest trend of all that's pushing um, a focus on energy efficiency, which is uh, there's new legislation which is which is just um, uh, relevant. Um, now, uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and the um, Sustainable Finance uh, Directives, at, uh, which essentially require, as of next year, for companies to uh, do this kind of reporting, the ESG reporting, which um, 
uh, ask them to look down their supply chain, look to rep report on their uh, carbon footprints and their energy footprints. And when a company starts to look, because it has to be transparent about this, for the first time, these if you're not a uh, an energy intense company, so if you're an aluminium manufacturer, and energy use has been strategic and core to your business proposition for forever. But if you're a, cl a clothing retailer or you're a bank uh, manage uh, bank system, you haven't really sort of necessarily felt the pressure to do an energy audit. And these types of things are now much more commonplace. And companies are now, as a result of these uh, needs to be transparent about this, taking a greater focus on it. I think that's actually the, 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 the key response to my little rant back there about why this isn't happening is that it doesn't it hasn't been happening because we really haven't been looking. We really haven't been trying. You know, I didn't look at my energy bills in Switzerland for three, four years. Um, and uh, and what you don't look for, you don't find. So um, definitely the fact that it is now coming under the under the magnifying glass about 10 years ago, I did some work with some grad students from Imperial where we. Um, surveyed companies to ask how they allocated money to energy efficiency, what was the process, and what was the discount rate that they either explicitly or implicitly used. And what we found was the discount rate was 30 to, 30 to, to, to uh, I think, technically 92%, because some of them said, oh, we'll only do it if it pays itself back within the same year, which I think is a 90% plus discount rate, effectively. Uh, and then some of them were using numbers like 30%. And so these are the least risky investments that they can possibly make because they guaranteed will save energy and yet they were not making them. I mean, if you, if you want, I mean, very much quotable. So the EFIG group that I that I rapporteur have mentioned, the EU uh, group of now 500 organizations working on these subjects launched a database that's Europe's largest database of real energy efficiency projects. And it's called DEEP, stands for De-Risking Energy Efficiency Projects. And the idea is you go with your project if you're a financial institution and it's in a particular industry or in a particular building, and you can go and compare the returns of that project and its technical characteristics against a database of 24,000 other projects which wow. are already in the database. So 11,000 of the projects are in buildings, 12,000 of the projects in industry. The median payback of all these projects is between two and four years. The investment per kilowatt, and this is an investment, not a cost, but the investment per kilowatt hour of energy saved is between 1.9 and 2.6 cents. So what that is, is that's a tenth of the current wholesale electricity cost in Spain, for example. So you're absolutely right. And there is a ton of evidence to suggest that our behavioral economic approach to energy savings is what's preventing us making sensible choices. But this is a, these are, that is an astonishing statistic, uh, because what you're saying is, is one or two cents, but that's a recurring, that's the investment. So that then produces a recurring every single year. And you know, I've had this conversation with executives saying, oh, we do this energy, you know, we, we do this energy efficiency investment, and it has a payback of 24%, it has a payback of 30%, it has a payback of, of, of 15%. And they look at it, and they're really proud. And I look at it and say, this is appalling, because what you're not doing is mining further down the stack. You know, if you, it, what all you're doing is the low-hanging fruit, the really remunerative stuff. But just think, if we applied a cost of capital, which, you know, what should it be? 5%, 7%? If you can raise a green bond against energy efficiency, you should be able to do things all the way down to a payback of, you know, 4 or 5% probably. And just think how we could, you know, take such a huge chunk out of um, not just climate change, but also costs. This is money that should be staying in consumers' pockets. Um, so it's quite an extraordinary opportunity, no question. I want to finish with um, renovations, right? Because it's relatively easy, and we are getting much better as an economy when we build something new to build it low carbon. Um, even five or so years ago, five or ten years ago, when you went to places like China or the GCC and they were building, they were still building really without thinking very hard about energy efficiency. That is drawing to a close. That even that new build is becoming efficient. But if you look at particularly the developed world, um, what percentage in 2050, I think it's 15% of the buildings will be new, will be built between now and 2050, and 85% will be what we've already got today. So how do we do 
large scale, not nibbling at the edges, but large scale retrofits? What's the answer to that? You're the expert. We've heard all your expertise. You've been working on it for 30 years. Tell us the answer. So I feel that we need an institutional home to help us deliver what amounts to, I think it's 1,500 um, renovations a minute, every minute between now and 2030. So it's it's something like uh, the, um, the renovation wave, the EU's renovation wave um, has a target of 35 million renovations by 2030. Um, that means we need to be doing them at a, at a clip of about three to four million a year. Um, at the moment, and there are plenty of examples across Europe of where these renovations have been technically have been done. Have, people are absolutely delighted. I read a survey that was done across multiple European countries just produced just a few weeks ago that said 78% of people surveyed, and it was 2,000 per country, um, would renovate their, their uh, building if they had the money. So, and this has come up time and time again, that people use the fact that, and, and, and reasonably so, because who has 25,000 euros just lying around ready to renovate your home? Um, uh, and so uh, my sort of answer to, to that question is, um, I think we need uh, to recognize that um, most of the buildings, two thirds of the buildings in Europe that we live in, were, were built before there were any form of standards, before there was any energy efficiency insulation put into them as a, as a matter of standard. And so we are living and working and, and, and sort of existing in, in deeply inefficient uh, buildings. And we ne we've been trying to highlight that point so much, so much over the past. And so I think we need to genuinely address this. As you've said, this needs to be a political, a political challenge at the highest level because it requires that level of societal motivation. Um, we need to provide, I think, um, the, something called a renovation loan or an instrument that allows buildings owners, and that's so there are 220 um, million homes in Europe. 70% um, of people live in a, a home that they own. So, so I know a lot of people say, what about the rented accommodation? What about the social accommodation? Yes, there are solutions for those too. But just thinking about the 70%, which is the bulk of that, and then the 50 million of those that have mortgages against them, I've come to the conclusion that there is a relationship, it is a financial relationship, and it exists between a concentrated group of entities, that is mortgage lenders, predominantly banks, but also funds, um, that constantly are talking about something to do with the financing of your building. They're collecting interest rate. They're doing something. So those lenders, so we, we launched a report that shows that people who have energy efficient homes have more money to pay back their uh, mortgage. I mean, it stands to reason. In other words, there is, ev there is evidence based on 800,000 data points that suggests that um, aside from other factors, if you have an energy efficient home, then you are able more, you're a better credit from a bank's perspective. Uh, banks are also concerned about climate risk in their portfolios. And if you are living in an inef inefficient uh, home, then essentially that is a transitional asset that could become a stranded asset in a net zero world, very likely to be. So banks need to start to identify who are the customers who can benefit from a renovation. And I think there needs to be a, 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 an EU-backed or UK government-backed renovation loan instrument that's super attractive. And when I say super attractive, I mean no-brainer super attractive, which, is, which to me means it's a zero-coupon instrument. So that means you don't pay interest until the end. It's provided to you at a government borrowing rate, which today in the UK for 30 years means 0.8%, and in the EU it means 0.5%. So to give you the numbers, at a compound rate of interest of 0.5%, if you borrow 20,000 euros today, in 30 years, you're going to pay back about 23,500. So who doesn't think that the value appreciation of your property over the 30-year period where you're not paying interest is going to be less than that amount? I reckon the average rule of thumb, the average amount that people are going to have to borrow is 10% of the value of their property. 
So let's get away from the idea that it's just changing the boiler or, or, or simple things. It's actually 10% of the value of your property. So that, that means if you live in a really expensive property that's really complex to reform, 10% of that value is going to be what you have to spend. So, But if you live in a simple, a sort of two up, two down, then 10% of that value is what you're going to have to spend. That money gets to you. The, the other interesting thing about, um, and I think this can be distributed, whilst it's government back, government back just means you can sell it, uh, you know, it's guaranteed. And so you, you don't have to worry about sort of credit assessments. It's much more um, just because if you're, if you're only providing an instrument that's only available to people who are great credits, then you're excluding a component of, of, of people who may be sitting at that level of, of not being able to get more debt. So it's a government-backed instrument that's provided to all these people, i.e. homeowners across all the social spectrums. Um, it doesn't have interest. So you notice the savings immediately. So you set you you do your renovation, you save the energy, and that cash flow is right there because you're not paying any interest until the end, um, or or of course until you sell the property or it or it or it passes on. Um, this uh, you get all the benefits sort of right, right right up, and the the banks who are facilitating this transaction. Um, have you as a better credit because now you know you're less likely to fall on your mortgage now because you've they've also greened the mortgage by the way the mortgage itself was sitting there uh, lent against an air for a G sort of rated um, uh, building which has now been upgraded into an A or a B rated building so they've now been able to convert what was a brown mortgage into a green mortgage and then they can securitize that on the, through a green bond this is the way that you've described so we have banks converting their mortgage books to from Fs and Gs and Ds to As and Bs. We have individuals benefiting from the additional comfort, the better acoustics, the better living conditions. And you would just have to talk to someone who's done a deep renovation to understand all of that. Um, and you've got essentially the economics of this, this working and, get, and us getting away from um, this question of sort of what's the break even, what's the payback? Because the reality is, I think you need to look to three sources of value for that, for that retrofit. The first source is the fact that you're going to have a present value of future energy savings, which is an amount. You're then going to have essentially a value, a value point. So in other words, you're, you're improving the performance of your building and that's worth something in, in the, 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 the the, the JRC in Europe put, put out a report and the EFIG sort of ratified that to say that that green premium could be between three and 8% of the value. So you're getting some value back from the fact that your property now stands out because it's a green property and it's higher efficiency. Um, and then part of that can be a government support program. So it's either in the fact that you're getting this special instrument, which is a low interest rate, which you wouldn't have normally benefited from. However, that doesn't come as a cost to government because, of course, government can have access directly to that uh, cost of borrowing. But we're cutting out all of the sort of like components of the, su of the, of the supply chain from the money being borrowed by government to being distributed to you through um, a bank. And, and, that, um, and that will... Um, provide you with uh, the, the, the government support. And, and if you're in, let's say, um, a, a community which is part of, which is undergoing a just transition. Uh, so in other words, you're in a, a, an area that used to be a sort of a hub of a coal industry, or you, you're in some social classes that are being poorly impacted by the climate transition of which there are, the just transition would suggest that you could also benefit from a grant to part pay that renovation. So in a sense, there were these three areas of benefit, which I think come together. And we need to be doing it, as I said, at the very beginning of this, to everybody. So it becomes like a seatbelt. It's sort of like, when are you going to do your, not are you going to do your renovation? When are you going to do your renovation? And maybe it's on your next move. So in eight years time, I'm going to have to do it because I'm going to move houses. Or maybe it's because we decided we're going to go on a camper van holiday and we've got that month or two that's needed when we're not going to be away from home and then we're going to do the renovation then. And then the, the, the funding question is no longer a question because all the banks are given access to this instrument. All the banks are offering it and, and kind of, I, I see this as, as being a sort of a win, win, win in a way that we haven't tried yet. Basically. Right. I mean, I mean, and it is on a, I mean, it is, uh, it, there's much to like about this idea because it's on a heroic scale. <laughs> and, um, and, and uh, if it could, if it could be done, it would almost certainly work, but there's also a lot of, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just imagining uh, ministries, treasuries, ministries of finance, listening to this and saying, hang on a second, you want to put 10% of the entire value of the housing stock of this country effectively onto the government's balance sheet um, to, to do this thing. And, um, and then, of course, you know, you get into the financial engineering pieces. I mean, don't, I, I, I'm just um, very mindful that JP Morgan is, of course, the bank that brought CDMs and CDSs 
and all these other instruments that nearly brought the world to an end and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in the US essentially do what you're talking about and, uh, and had to be bailed out. So a lot can go wrong on the financing, but I don't want to shoot down the idea, but equally we don't really have time to, to un, unpick it all. Um, but don't do, me, don't, don't do me the disservice of forcing me to take responsibility. Energy efficiency takes responsibility for the financial crisis now as a result of the fact that we're just... No, but you, don't, but you don't want energy efficiency. You don't want some heroic energy efficiency scheme which runs up into the, you know, which will, you know, the UK alone, it's half a trillion pounds that, that, that is needed to renovate just homes, never mind all the businesses. And so, you know, the numbers become very big, very quickly when you do heroic things. And there was one thing that you talked about in your system where you, you pay no interest. Well, if you're saving on your energy bill, then at some point, why not start the payments back? And a lot of the schemes that have been tried, you know, pay bonds and so on, they do involve repayments off the energy savings. Um, but you seem to have said, oh, that's all too complicated. Let's just do something simple. Let's just get the stick. Now, by the way, somebody who would very much like your idea, I suspect, is um, episode 67's guest, Mariana Matsukato, who's all in favor of massive uh, missions, uh, particularly when they're state funded, uh, because, of course, the state has the magic money machine. Um, so, uh, so, so why not do it that way? Um, but please let please let me def let defend just a, just a you, tiny bit, a, a tiny bit, a, tiny bit a, because, short, a short minute to defend uh, one minute, uh, one this, minute. This unwarranted so, attack on your on your new system. So so of course <laughs> of course the debt is still on the building. So it's not the government funding this. The building has to fund it and it has to be paid back. So the fact that the, the interest is being rolled up towards the end is just a, it's just a nice to have. But, but the, it, the interest is being is being paid back. Now remember that property ownership tends to be among older people and those people have home equity and that home equity is going to be transferred to the next generation who benefits from the fact that all this renovation work is going to be half materials half labor and that's the reason why Fatih Birol who also came on your show referred to energy efficiency as the jobs machine because it is so there's going to be all these jobs that are going to be being done to do all these renovations and these new companies and these new uh, startups which will become very valuable as a result of that I hope um, so there's a transfer of wealth that's taking place from the, 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 the embedded locked up home equity, which people complain about having gone up so much recently. So we're taking that, borrowing against it, and then we're providing jobs today for the people that um, are keen to, to do them. We're providing st market stimulus and GDP growth in the areas of the materials and the, technolo the innovative technologies that we'll have to invent to make these things cheaper and more cost effective and better. Um, and then, of course, when the properties are transferred, this wealth and 50% of all of the European wealth and UK wealth is in property. So it's the right place to look if you want to find half a trillion pounds, right? Let's look to the properties that are there, right? And instead of a wealth tax or a property tax, right. let's use this as a way of unlocking that, that money, which is still borrowed against the property so that when the property is sold or inherited, that money is paid back to government at no okay. loss because the compound interest has been, has been building up over that time. Yeah. You know, let's just let's just abstract at one level from because you know we could we 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 could dive down a rabbit hole and we still you know we wouldn't have dealt with um, uh, housing association or or socially owned housing where you know we have this extraordinary um, situation where the state is paying pensions and housing benefits to a lot of people who are taking that money and giving them straight to utilities because they live in leaky and inefficient homes. So of course, it's a marvelous thing if you're a utility because effectively the state is just paying your, your revenues year in, year out. And in fact, you know, with things like in this country, winter heat allowance, even more money for the same things. Um, but the, so that's another sector we could dive into. But the bottom line here is that we've talked about the human behavior and I think what we're doing is finishing on a note around finance, that the fundamental problem is that the cost of capital for energy efficiency is far too high. If you can get that cost of capital down to, you know, you talked about 0.5, 0.8%, I talked about 4 or 5%. But the fact is that companies are using 30 to 90% and individuals are using 30% plus as well, because very often they would also expect these very short payback times for any sort of energy efficiency investment. So that's the core problem uh, around finance, I think. And, um, and that is, if I'm not wrong, essentially the core problem that you've been working on in the finance space around, uh, uh, around the financing of energy efficiency for all the years that you've been doing it.
Yep, it's not it's not the only issue. Um, you know, we have to bring down the costs. We have to improve the innovating the supply chain, the business models that deliver renovation. Energy Sprong is doing uh, sort of you know these multiple. Uh, um, uh, sort of like fa factory driven uh, re renovations to try and bring down those costs. And there are other models across Europe working, but basically, Michael, you're, I think you're right. I think we just need to think of energy efficiency kind of like a seat belt, which is, you know, there's, there's benefit, societal benefit, there's individual benefit there. We've been looking at it all the wrong way until now and we need a massive uh, campaign that instead of, you know, instead of you recycling to, to save the climate, you renovate. To save the climate. So energy efficiency, um, I've called it the Swiss army knife of climate action because it does so many things, generate jobs, etc. Fatih Birol has called it, called it the jobs machine. Um, we've called it the mainspring of any uh, green COVID uh, recovery. It's been called so many things. I don't think I've heard of it referred to as a seatbelt before. Um, <laughs> but I, I want to thank you uh, for joining us today and for spending time with us. And uh, I'm really delighted that we've done such a deep dive into energy efficiency because so often it doesn't get its own show. It doesn't get its own champion. And I think you have uh, uh, helped to correct that balance here today. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Michael. So that was Peter Sweetman, CEO and founder of Climate Strategy and one of the world's great experts on the financing of energy efficiency. And that brings to an end series four of Cleaning Up. It's been quite the ride, starting with Tony Abbott, former Prime Minister of Australia, and including some of the visionary leaders behind the Paris Agreement and Net Zero. We'll be taking a short break over Christmas and kicking off series five on the 5th of January with a towering figure behind the world's response to the climate challenge. I'll leave you to speculate on who that might be, and meanwhile, stay safe, enjoy the break, and I'll see you in January.